had a distinguished career as an astrophysicist. After his MSc in physics from the IIT Bombay, he did his PhD from the University of Hampshire in the US. Subsequently, he joined the Goddard Flight Space Center in NASA, worked in X-ray and gamma ray astrophysics. He was a member of a team called EGRIT. EGRIT is not the bird. It is an acronym for Energetic Gamma Ray Experiment Telescope. It observed various uh, interesting features of the nearby galaxies, especially the centers of the galaxies. After he returned to India, he continued his research in the Raman Research Institute and joined ISRO as the group director of the Space Astronomy Group. He was involved in the scientific payloads of Chandrayaan-1 for X-ray and gamma-ray astrophysical experiments. He has many awards to his credit, NASA Group Achievement Award, NASA GSFC Special Group Activity Award, and more recently, Hari Om Prerit Vikram Sarabhai Award. He has more than 100 publications. Where we look at how the night sky looks like, and of course the planetarium here gives you a very good feel for what the night sky is. And uh, early days when uh, humans uh, were... Uh, um, you know, purely uh, people who work from when the sun is up and stops working when the sun is down, looks at the sky and wonders about the nature of this uh, night sky, which was always uh, uh, a very interesting question to ask, what are these points of object in the sky, bright objects, the bright points in the sky? And uh, much later, through various uh, activities from many, many important scientists, we understand that today that is made of stars, and uh, that uh, stars are uh, part of a galaxy, that we are part of a spiral galaxy, and that there are many more galaxies in this uh, universe that we know of. So the science of astronomy is today largely focused on looking at uh, electromagnetic radiation from space as well as uh, ground, as, uh, from ground as well as space in terms of the experiment, but primarily originated from space at all wavelengths. So the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum is very broad, going all the way from radio up to, say, gamma rays. However, unlike many areas of science, uh, we, this is done in a very passive mode. You cannot trigger the universe to do something. You cannot ask a star to explode because I want to see it. Okay? And you can't uh, do anything in a manner to trigger such a system. So it's largely passive remote sensing, and you just watch it as it happens. You never know when it's going to happen, so you must be prepared to observe this any time from any part of the sky. And then we use scientific analysis to understand the nature of this source. Our question is to ask, why is the sun so hot? Why, how long can it last? How does it die? All these are important questions to ask. So that's how we pursue the science of astronomy. So one of the first things you want to ask ourselves is, uh, when you look at a star, like the sun, how do you know how hot it is? You can't go there and measure it. So how do you measure the temperature? Does anybody know how we measure temperature of a star? Not from the experts, non-experts. All right, we will go through this process of how we measure temperature of a distant object. So this is uh, a little bit of physics here. Uh, based on uh, active uh, work that has been done by physicists, we have, uh, we have an understanding of the fact that bodies, which are often called as black bodies, which are those in thermal equilibrium, characterized by a single temperature, for example, if this pen has a, has a temperature T, and if it's in thermal equilibrium, it's a black body, it emits radiation at many wavelengths, and the shape of the radiation is characteristic of what we call as black body radiation, and the peak emission is connected to the temperature of the object. So there's a connection between temperature and the peak wavelength. So uh, the simple way to do that is I would take measure, like an experiment, and measure the wavelength, uh, for various wavelengths, I would measure what is the brightness of this object. So let's say I have these points. And then, as any scientist would do, I would fit a function over it. I'll ask the question mathematically, what is the shape that best interprets this set of data? So this, for example, is the shape of a black body spectrum. That has a peak value. So I derive that peak value. And I find that there's a relationship between the peak uh, in this case, lambda or wave or frequency, and the peak frequency and temperature are connected. Uh, and the relationship says, whenever the peak frequency increases, the temperature also increases. So, if I know the peak frequency from this measurement, I know that, and from this graph, I can then read out the temperature. So now I know the temperature of the star 
if I measure the spectrum. So this is a fairly straightforward thing that we do. And uh, so that's how we measure temperature, because the temperature is an important point. Uh, a second point I want to address is something called inverse square law. We are familiar with those who do physics in uh, schools, you'll realize there is something called inverse square law under which, in this case, intensity of a, of a source of a certain uh, intrinsic luminosity falls off 1 over the square of the distance. So if this is i at a distance r, as I go to 2 times r, the intensity falls by 1 fourth, 3 times r, intensity falls by 1 ninth. So what you observe is intensity rapidly falls, decreases as you move away from the source of radiation. So I could put this on a graph, that would be intensity versus distance from the point source. You can see this curve very, very fast decreases. By the time it's at 10 times r, we're now at 100 of uh, the original intensity of the source. So this is an important point to remember. Uh, if I have a detector, you know, typically if you want to measure such a thing, you, you put a detector in space or on ground, and the detector only sees part of that complete beam from a, from a, from a star or a galaxy. It measures a small fraction of it. And if I now move that, uh, so that is, if it is a faint signal there, it will even be fainter when you go further away because of this 1 over r squared effect. And the one way to address that would be to build a bigger detector further away to really see the full signal. So the need to look, have larger systems as you go further, as you want to observe objects that are much further away is sort of clear from this uh, uh, cartoon. So to reiterate, uh, let us look at some of these uh, distances. The sun to earth distance, we use this term astronomical unit. So let's assume it's 1 AU roughly works out to be 150 million kilometers. If I move from Sun to Mars, our, the Mars mission right now, uh, uh, the MOM is going around Mars, or about to go around Mars, that's about 1.5 AU, about 50% further away than where we are from Sun. We go to the Sun-Jupiter distance, now it's already gone to 5.2 AU. Already you'll have difficulty with regard to uh, getting solar power. Communication, already there's a communication at 1.5 AU itself, you have a delay of about 20 minutes or so. Uh, as you go to Pluto, you now we have 40 AU, now we are reaching the edge of our, uh, is now we are, I'll switch the units in terms of light years, 4.2 light years. Center of the Milky Way, 30,000 light years. The nearest galaxy, 2 million light years. The most distant object in the universe, something close to 13 billion light years. So, we can see the spread in astronomy is substantially large. The scale of distances involved is large, and that has a serious implication if you remember the inverse square law. So once again, to repeat it, imagine if I stretch this distance out to very, very far and distances beyond our galaxy, you are seeing the intensity falls very rapidly. So study of ast astronomical study of objects that are typical, uh, typical astronomical distances are very difficult because the signals are extremely weak. One other thing I want to emphasize is, uh, is the number of photons. The, the, the degree to which we can measure something or understand something depends on how bright it is. And uh, the number of photons, photons uh, are emitted from, at all energies I mentioned. Typically, most sources would emit across a large range of wavelengths. But as you go to higher and higher energy photons, the number of, the number of photons available comes down because it's harder to produce those, energy, those photons. And so if I now look at this... Uh, it's a slightly technical plot, but if I were to plot this in terms of log of a number, as a log of energy, I get a, a line, and for a particular value of this alpha, where alpha is equal to 1, and if I see at energy E1, I have n photons, at 10 times energy, at 10 times more energetic photon, the number falls to one-tenth of it. So the, as you go to higher energies, this number of photons available from a source decreases very, very rapidly. So these are important points, background on which we will actually now address the rest of it. And so I go back to 400 years ago when Galileo uh, contributed something important to astronomy. What did Galileo contribute? Telescope. Okay. So telescope is important because, why is telescope important? Because telescope does something very interesting. It actually uh, collects more light from, the, from a source. And I told you, number of photons is critical. 1 over r squared law applies, which means I need to capture as much of it. So I, use, I need a concentrator, I need a mirror, I need a lens, something that allows me to actually collect light from a natural physical source. And uh, 
or from an engineering point of view, you will say the signal to noise ratio is actually substantially enhanced because I can use a small detector to capture light from a large area so you get uh, more sensitive. So I'm now going to spend a few minutes just discussing modern astronomy in India. Uh, India has contributed in the ancient times much more, but I'll focus on the modern version of it. In 1876, uh, the Madras Observatory was actually set up under the East India Company for the promotion, for promoting the knowledge of astronomy, geography, and navigation in India. You see the broad coverage of what astronomy is supposed to do. Uh, and soon this observatory uh, became an important point in terms of working on fundamental positions of stars, and a large number of stellar positions were actually catalogued. But there was an interesting event in the August 18, 1868, uh, when for the first time spectroscopes were used during an eclipse event. Spectroscopes are things, something that tells us about the energy of the incoming photon. And a new line close to the sodium emission, D2 line, was actually observed. And to the left of it, it was seen. In the, so a new line was observed to the left of it in the, in the spectrum of the sun. It was an unknown element because, you know, you look, try to characterize every spectral feature with an element. And they couldn't identify what this was. It turned out to be the discovery of helium. So it's an important observation back in 1868. And then this Madras Observatory transitioned into the Kodaikanal Observatory, which is still operating. 100 years of data. We have um, pictures of the sun taken every day for the last 100 years. And those are all now being digitized into a world archive. And this, in the early 70s, transitioned into the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, which is the leading astronomy institute in the country. Astronomy in India has actually flourished quite a bit. I mean, there's a large number of facilities today existing uh, that focus on various issues up in Ladakh. And uh, there is the Indian Obs Astronomical Observatory. It's a two-meter telescope sitting at nearly 4.5 meter kilometers above sea level, one of the highest uh, observatories in the world. Uh, and, with, uh, and that has the advantages of actually providing very good uh, uh, observing, uh, en uh, observing environment for telescopes. Uh, Aries in Nainital. There is other centers in Kavalur and Kodaikanal, Gavri Bidnur in, this, uh, in Karnataka, the radio telescopes near Pune, and uh, also there's gamma ray telescopes in Mount Abu, as well as the infrared telescopes in, uh, um, in Mount Abu. So we have a variety of such things going on, and I will now quickly flash some pictures. This is the largest uh, indigenously made uh, telescope, uh, the 2.3 meter telescope uh, operated by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics called the Vainabapu Telescope. Uh, operates in the optical in the 1985, it was completed, it's still operating. Uh, the telescope in, in Nainital, Mount Abu. On, this, is a, this is a two meter telescope that is uh, heavily used today by the Indian astronomers because it's, uh, because of its primarily the location is extremely important and is able to do world class science with that. And uh, Ayuka in Pune has a two meter telescope. These are the radio telescopes, the world's largest low frequency radio array, uh, doing excellent science, uh, situated, uh, built by India and situated near Pune. And you have these uh, radio heliographs operated, uh, installed originally jointly with RRI and Indian Institute of Astrophysics uh, near Gauri Bidhino, operating at low frequency. It's primarily used to look at the sun and trying to ask when sun explodes and sun provides uh, what are called coronal mass ejections, these ejections can be best mapped using uh, radio uh, at these uh, frequencies. And these are the gamma ray telescopes. They are a little different from the usual telescopes. They use the atmosphere to detect. And the shower of blue light comes in. And these detectors are used to detect gamma rays. And this is an operating gamma ray telescope, again, in, Lad in Ladakh, Hanley. And I just want to now emphasize that this area of astronomy, astronomy has a lot of spin-offs that is of relevance for many of you. Today's CCD technology that you know, have in your, uh, in your cameras largely came from uh, astronomy needs. Uh, when Fairchild made the first of these high quality CCDs, it was primarily for uh, astrophysical applications. And, and, and the continued push by astronomy to actually uh, make very clean, high quality images, uh, larger formats, greater pixelization, etc. is all benefit to the public. Simulations have been very important in astronomy, and there are many simulations that are used in 
energy and gas industry, telescope optics produces, uh, uh, contributes enormously to lithography. Lithography is the way by which we would imprint uh, things in silicon. Uh, scanners are used in very day to day applications, image processing, uh, computing from SETI. And there's a reference frame primarily derived using quasars that is now important because GPS uses it, as well as for the Mars mission for the orbit insertion and its en route in order to really derive exactly where the spacecraft is in terms of position, velocity, and acceleration. You actually utilize the reference frame of quasars to derive it using something called delta DOR. Um, processes that are not possible on nature in, on that we don't observe in ground, but are actually available in nature have been discovered through astronomy. Uh, processes that are more efficient than fusion, 20 times more efficient than fusion. We don't have time to go into that today. Uh, star catalog we just discussed. Space weather warning systems. Asteroids, which may be of concern. You know, today the, 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 the nearby, the, the, the comet that's approaching us is approaching very close to Earth. Uh, asteroids uh, are potential concerns. So these are also things that would come, come, come from astronomy. So just to recap, it's an old science, and uh, it enables important technologies, and India, I think, has a major role to play in astronomy research. So let me then now transition to looking at some, uh, some of the upcoming programs. What we now talked about so far are things that in the past and ongoing activities, but let's look at some upcoming programs. Mirrors are, as we discussed, critical technologies for doing high-end astronomy. Now, we made this 2.34 meter uh, mirror for the Kavalur uh, Vainabapu telescope, largest one we've built in India. Uh, in the laboratory of electro-optics and ISRO branch in Pinya, they make mirrors for our space programs. They are now getting close to one meter scale. But on ground, the largest mirrors we've done is something like 8.4 meters. And as you start building them bigger and bigger and bigger, you have a problem of retaining its shape because gravity is a concern. And these telescopes have to move. So even though you get the right shape in a given orientation, the shape may not be retained in some other orientation. So the concept of a single monolithic mirror to enhance capacity in astronomy is now becoming very difficult to handle. And so the age of segmented mirrors have actually come up. Mirrors that a, a, a large monolithic mirror is not possible, so you have an array of small mirrors together forming a big mirror. And the implication of that would be in terms of, uh, of having to provide control on individual mirror levels such that the shape is actually maintained. Now, this has already been done in the largest existing telescopes today, that is the Keck telescopes on top of, Mount, of uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. There are two large telescopes, 10 meters. So now there is a global program called the 30 meter telescope. It has been now fairly well realized that in order to build the next largest telescopes, it, a single country cannot do it anymore. And we go into a larger, a large international collaboration. And so the 30 meter telescope, where the diameter of the mirror is 30, 30 meters, is now being considered with India participating along with China, Japan, Canada, and the United States. And uh, we've just about uh, receiving the government approval for this, for the 10% participation in the 30 meter telescope. So I'll just quickly uh, brief you a bit on this, because it's a major program coming up. 10 years from now, it's supposed to be ready. Uh, so it is about 12 times uh, uh, better than uh, HST and uh, than the 8 meter telescope. The sensitivity goes to nearly 200 times better than the current telescope, using some technology called adaptive optics. Uh, so it has uh, many elements. There is a big central mirror, and that is not a single mirror, 492 segments, each segment about 1.4 meters in a, a hexagon is arranged in a manner such that the total system acts like a 30 meter and has to be very, very precisely aligned. And we will now discuss some concerns with that. So that the light coming through the aperture falls on this primary mirror, gets uh, reflected off to a secondary mirror. And then it comes down to a tertiary mirror at the bottom that's then reflected off to the side to use it for various instruments. So it's a very large uh, mirror. Uh, the telescope is again the same, similar thing that shows a range of 
experiments on both sides of it that will be able to utilize the signature, the signal coming from the tertiary mirror. Now, first, let me just uh, show a cartoon of how these mirrors are very different from the usual mirrors we make. So usually, in order to make a mirror, what you do is you take a big blank, uh, which is made up of glass that doesn't easily, whose thermal expansion is very small. So you have new materials called zero door, uh, whose, which has nearly zero thermal expansion capacity. And we would then grind it in a manner, and then polish it, you know, a really heavy mechanical job that leads to a high quality finish. Now, the technology they're looking at is you take a blank, and you then bend it, you stress that thing, you stress the, uh, the blank using mechanical forces, then you polish the top, make it be a flat surface, and then you release the stress, and then you have the shape that you want. So this is called stress mirror polishing, and uh, this is a technology that was used to make the Keck telescopes, and uh, after a great deal of uh, debates on many techniques to make mirrors, finally decided the best way to do this would be to use a stress mirror polishing. So the 300 and 492 mirrors of the 30 meter telescope would be made using the stress mirror polishing. Now about 100 of these are going to be built in Bangalore in a facility that we're going to set up by the Indian University of Astrophysics and the TMT collaboration of India in our campus in Huskote, about an hour's drive from here. So starting next year, I think we should uh, start the process. The building will be ready to, to initiate this process. So this is an interesting uh, technique to make mirrors. Another thing you'll see once you have a large number of segments is the segments will have to be aligned on a regular basis. The wind is blowing, the process disturbances, and uh, as, a, as it rotates, the gravity loading is different for each of the segments. So to keep doing co-alignment, co-focusing, and co-facing in order to get a very sharp image. And that has been done on the fly in real time. So there are technologies that have been addressed. So the, each of these segments are put onto a structure, and the structure will have uh, the structure is also being made in India. Uh, it will have, there are sensors that will tell how close is a mirror. And that gap between mirrors is roughly about a few millimeters. And you want to measure that very well. And so, so these, these are called edge sensors now being made in Pondicherry. There is a company there called General Optics, which is actually making these for the 30 meter telescope. And using capacitance measurements between two plates, you know, which is a very sensitive way to measure whether it's aligned or offset. You feed that back to what are called actuators, mechanical actuators. So this is a mechanical actuator. Basically, at one point, it pushes the mirror or, or push, pulls it in a manner where the shape of the mirror can be adjusted based on what the edge sensor provides. But there are you know, a large number of them. You know, there are about 1,500 actuators. And so they all have to operate in one go such that the shape of the mirror is being maintained. A large number of students actively, uh, you know, these are graduate students, students who are doing their M techs, students who are doing their PhDs, and in some cases, a few B techs and, and uh, MSc students are there. They're all involved in these issues, put alongside many other telescopes on top of uh, this mountain in Hawaii, and roughly about 10, 10 years from now. So, the 7th of October is when they're actually doing the groundbreaking ceremony uh, for this telescope. So, that's an important uh, facility for us in India, and we hope that will really revolutionize our capacity to do front-ranking astronomy from ground. So now, since time is limited, I'll go to the next thing that would be astronomy from space, and uh, ISRO, in collaboration with many institutes, have been building this astronomy satellite called AstroSat, that has many instruments, there are these ultraviolet instruments at the center of this, which are the world's best UV telescopes today, the sharpest eyes in ultraviolet, about three times better than what has ever been flown before. That's a very important thing. Uh, there are the large area of X-ray proportional counters pro provided by the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. And there is a telescope that operates in X-rays, also from TIFR. From the ISRO Satellite Center, there is an instrument that looks for changes in the X-ray sky called Scanning Sky Monitor. And then, again, from TIFR, there is a an X-ray instrument for looking at uh, the spectrum of hard X-rays. The UV instrument, as I said, is a twin telescope. It, the UV is broadly broken up into far UV and near UV, and, uh, and at the bottom of which you have uh, detectors that are like CCDs. They're called CMOS detectors, and they provide, as I said, the best angular resolution so far uh, achieved uh, because of some important technology breakthroughs we managed. 
these are actual pictures of these two telescopes now uh, on hold, uh, kept uh, ready at the uh, MG Kimenon laboratory of IAA in Huskote. We had a small problem uh, last year uh, with the, you know, these instruments have to be put on a vibration table, a distro to, to be shaken to simulate the launch conditions of a satellite. And in that process, we had a small uh, flaw. Uh, it has to be fixed, and now that's getting fixed. The tell us the, uh, the, fix, the integra reintegration of that process is happening right now, actually. And these are, uh, this whole AstroSat has capacity to look at uh, important things. Uh, just take one example of it, which is the black holes of extremely large masses. There are a lot of black holes, and there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy that may be about a million times the mass of our sun, but there are even bigger black holes in systems called quasars or active galactic nuclei that may be, you know, thousand million times the mass of the sun, from which you have all sorts of emission of particles, and uh, AstroSat is expected to actually shed a lot of important and uh, uh, useful uh, signature observational data on such systems. Uh, let me move on to other things, that is to study the sun. The sun, as you know, is uh, a star that's very close to us. This is an eclipse picture of the sun. And what you see is the disk of the sun is now blocked out. And what you see is this outer part, which we call as a corona. Now, solar science has really improved substantially in the last uh, few decades, uh, primarily in terms of understanding the, the, the disk of the sun and the interior of the sun. But in terms of the corona, we still don't seem to know, know much of it. And it sort of begins with this puzzle that at the center of the sun where you have a core that is very, very hot, 15 million degrees temperature, which is where the nuclear fusion reactions are taking place. And as, the, as that heat uh, propagates to the surface, it cools off a little bit. There's convection here. And when it gets to the surface of it, it is only about, does anybody know the temperature of the surface of the sun? 6,000 degrees, let's say. So, much cooler compared to 15 million degrees. So, which is natural, you have a hot source and you go further away, you expect that temperature to come down. What is puzzling, of course, is the fact that once you cross the disk of the sun and go into the corona and you measure the temperature there, the temperature rises and rises to nearly a few million degrees temperature, uh, degree centigrade, and that is a puzzle. What is heating this corona? And this has been remained a constant puzzle. So, the heating of the corona is a question that has been troubling solar astronomers and is still not understood. So, so ISRO, in collaboration with many institutes, in particular the Institute of Astrophysics, is now planning a mission called Aditya. I see there's a poster outside on Aditya, uh, where this is specifically meant to uh, look at study the corona of this. So, you have a, what is called a coronagraph. Now, the best way to start, time to study a corona is, of course, during an eclipse, but that doesn't happen all the time. It won't happen in places that you want it to happen. So what you then do is create an artificial eclipse. And you can create an artificial eclipse using either a, something to block it or do something else. And I'll discuss that in a minute. But primarily what it tries to do is it is not trying to study the inner center of the sun, the inner disk of the sun, but rather this outer region, very close to the disk of the sun to something like three times the radius of the sun. This is the region where we often see uh, events which are called coronal mass ejections. We have large amount of plasma suddenly blown away from the sun that propagates through interstellar me inter interplanetary medium and even hits Earth and often with very drastic effect, very dra dramatic events such as producing large uh, bright aurorae but also leading to destructive properties like you know where you have uh, power grids affected in some level even electronics of various kinds affected, satellites affected such that, uh, so it is very important to actually ensure that we have some mechanism to track it, track such events, so, and ideally, in the long run, make predictions of it. And that is the whole subject of space weather. And so one of the key components of space weather is trying to understand the velocity, the initiation and, and, and the velocity of these uh, coronal mass ejections. So studying this inner region of the, sun, of the sun, which has not been done so far because of various technology difficulties, will give us an edge in actually making these predictions regarding when and the, the coronal mass ejection uh, will interact with the Earth's atmosphere, and if so, take appropriate steps in that regard. So, there is a complex design for these optics of this uh, coronagraph, but all I want to do is emphasize 
a, 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 an interesting technology or interesting concept through which you create a coronagraph. Uh, so what you have is an entrance aperture. It's about 20 centimeters large mirror here. And this mirror reflects this light onto a mirror M2. And this mirror M2 is a bit unique. It actually has a hole in it. And that hole, through that hole, the disk light of the sun is ejected out. And the outer part of the, of the M2 mirror reflects only the coronal light. And I'll show that in the next uh, slide. So here it is. So this is mirror M2. It omits the disk light by cutting a hole. And the hole has to be a precisely this right shape, the right size, to only throw out the disk light. If I make it too big, I lose the important coronal information that I'm seeking. If I make it too small, the intense heat of the sun can actually do serious destructive damage to everything down the chain. The whole tell us the instruments are going to be destroyed. So from a technology perspective, there is an important requirement to ensure that the alignment of the system is maintained pre, after, even after launch, and the satellite stability has to be held such that the sun is really, uh, the, the hole is perfectly aligned to the disk of the sun. But that's the technique we're using to actually create the coronal images. Okay. Let me now move on to a few other things, since our topic is broad in terms of both astronomy and space. I just want to get into another area that may be of much more interest to uh, the wider public, and that is uh, something with astrobiology and the search for extraterrestrial light. And what has astronomy got to do with it? And I'll discuss that. This picture, I just often say, is indeed uh, an image that has changed the world. Because, you know, when uh, humans could go into space and actually take such a photograph, it just showed the beauty of Earth. Absolutely a beautiful place. I mean, you can't find such a, such a planet anywhere in spite of uh, searching throughout not just our solar system and beyond. Uh, there have been important discoveries recently regarding the Titan. Uh, Titan shows lakes. So far, no, no feel for whether there's life in Titan. There is a satellite of uh, Saturn called Enceladus, which shows very interesting features of, of uh, occasional uh, sprays of, of some liquid coming from, the, uh, from beneath the surface and spraying out. Using some techniques in astronomy, they have been able to actually derive that there is water in this spray. That's very important. Water often is a good indicator of potential life. And so Enceladus is something of great importance. I mean, we had a small team in uh, Isaac study, possibility to get into Enceladus, a 30-year 30, 30 mission. And so uh, Hegde and team had done this work. Actually. Uh, overall, in terms of understanding of the, the history and evolution of the solar system, we know there are, today there are stable planets. However, in the early formation of the solar system, there would have been large number of perturbations. Jupiter and Saturn would have perturbed the movement of uh, the other planets. Uh, and uh, so there are interesting resonances which come only after a series of large number of such interactions between planets. Today, even for the Mars mission, in order for us to calculate the trajectory to get to Mars, one has to worry about the presence, not just about uh, the gravitational uh, perturbations arising, not just from the sun, the moon, the earth, and Jupiter, but also all the planets in the solar system. It really makes a difference. So, so in order to understand the formation of the total solar system, one has to do this in a very integrated manner. And the initial phase of it, there would have been a lot of bodies that have been pushed around, moved around, collisions, and, and there was a phase of heavy bombardment about 3.9 billion years ago. The solar system itself is roughly 4.6 billion years ago. So shortly after the formation of the solar system, there was this phase where there were also lots of collisions between bodies, and there are some evidences of that. Even on Earth, there is this Barringer crater. No, this is the one in uh, Australia, 22 million year old crater. So you see these impacts from large bodies hitting the surface of the Earth. Barringer crater in the US, 1.2 kilometers. There's even one in India, Lonar Lake, uh, about 50,000 years ago. So, and very recently we heard in Russia the, the close shave that occurred, and about 100 years ago in the Tunguska region of uh, Siberia a large impact occurred. So Earth has been largely shielded from some of this because of the presence of an atmosphere. And uh, the fact that we are now looking at it you know, after so many years since the formation of the solar system. But the search for life does not, uh, has, all of this has some implication to the, the sustenance of life. But uh, it has been spurred on by an important contribution to astronomy. And that is 
we, the sun is only one of the many, many stars in the galaxy. Our galaxy is a spiral galaxy. This is like a picture, a cart, an artistic concept of a picture taken from above the disk of the spiral galaxy. And so the sun is here, about 26,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. Large number of uh, stars in each of these spiral arms. And so we now assume there are about 100 billion stars in this galaxy. And the, uh, the sun is nothing special, one of the many such possible galaxies. The, pro the possibility of having solar systems elsewhere is a very viable uh, uh, issue, and we should really be searching for it. So with that in mind, astronomers have been looking for what, are, what we now call as exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. And one of the techniques would be, used, would be to use Doppler shifts. You look at the light coming from, a, from the parent star, and if you see a change in its frequency as over time, uh, that suggests the star is being perturbed by another body, and quite likely that could be a planet. But this requires very, very precise uh, control over the our, uh, capacity to measure these small changes in frequencies. A second way to do this would be to look at what are called transits. Now you've all, some of you at least have seen the Venus transit. Venus goes in front of the disk of the sun, and you can study many things in the process. So uh, you can also have planets going in front of, the, of a star. Of course, you're not able to resolve that, but the way you would notice it is in the form of a reduction in light coming from the star. And if it's periodic, if I keep waiting for a second passage, and a third passage, and a fourth passage, I can now really conclude that there could be planets in the system, and there's a signatures arising from this dip in the intensity of the light curve. So these are called transit methods, and there was a very recent uh, US mission, NASA mission called Kepler, that stared at one part of the sky for nearly four years. And all it did was to look at the brightness of every star in this wide field, and ask, how does the brightness change with time? And with many of them, what you see is small changes in the light, intensity of the light, and these small changes have now been con uh, understood as arising from the transiting of planets in front of them. It's a very, very small change in the light intensity, but it's a very powerful way to discover these things. So this is a, this is a simulation of such a transit. So these are actual measurements of this, uh, of this of brightness of the star. At some point, you see the brightness decreases. That's because there's a dot passing in front of it. And then it recovers. And then what you do is you fit this data, and you see a dip. And from the dip, you can actually calculate many things. So I'll just run it one more time. So you, very simple experiment. You just once this dot shows up, there's a decrease in the in the strength of the light, and you use that to measure this. So, so with very precise measurement of these uh, difference in light intensity, one can actually uh, derive uh, certain parameters of that. For example, the size can be estimated. From the previous measure of, of Doppler, you can actually measure mass. So in principle, you can measure density of these objects, which is very, very interesting. I mean, you can't see these things, but you're actually able to uh, derive densities. It is, I, sh I should say, there have been a few cases of direct imaging of these planets, uh, because of, uh, in, particularly in the infrared, where the contrast between the star and the planet is less. So there have been a large number of these things from the Kepler mission, and there are what are called potentially habitable exoplanets, about 12 of them. And the habitability is rather driven by this definition that it is a zone distance from, the, from a star where water remains in liquid form. So if it's a very hot star, it's going to be further away. A cooler star is going to be closer. So when you find a planet in this habitable zone, then we start thinking these are interesting planets. And if they have masses similar to Earth, we can really do interesting stuff. There's a, Example of a case where six such planets have been seen, and now this number has even increased around a single star. So we have a solar system. So a lot of things have actually moved uh, in terms of uh, this particular thing. Another interesting thing that, uh, again, from astronomy we were able to do is if you look at a star, and if there is a planet in front of it, and if the planet has an atmosphere, the star's light coming through the atmosphere undergoes absorption as seen in the spectrum of that. Like these are these lines. The light in these two bands have been absorbed by the atmosphere. The, the absorption, where it gets absorbed, those particular frequencies in, will tell us more about the composition of this atmosphere. So not only are we able to say there are planets whose masses are derived, whose radius is known, we can now even tell if there's an atmosphere, what is the composition of the atmosphere. 
But this composition has, our, has led us to conclude there are planets with water, amino acids, not amino acids exactly, but uh, at least you can see certain complex uh, organics. If in a few cases you are actually seeing uh, argon, methane, and so on. So there are interesting signatures now coming that suggest that if you pursue this very carefully, you can actually do through astronomical signatures, you can actually look at the compositional nature of the atmosphere of these planets. And one remaining thing, of course, is to understand the surface feature of these, of these planets. So now, there is a very famous equation uh, that Drake put together in 1961, called the Drake's equation, where uh, this probability of life elsewhere in the universe was worked out. It's a very uh, well-known thing, many of you would have seen it. It starts off with a bunch of parameters, n, the number of stars, you multiply that with the fraction with planetary systems, number of average number of star planets suitable for life, probability that life starts on a planet, probability that life produces intelligent beings, probability that they want to communicate, fractional life to the star when such a life form exists. And if you put it all together and you can actually give an upper limit and a lower limit to each of these numbers and you can multiply them and you will end up with a number that seems to be not very different. It's not zero for sure. And that's an interesting question overall in the context of uh, uh, looking for life. Now, the search for evidence for life in Mars took a, had an interesting thing a few, some years ago when a Martian meteorite with careful study was showed this presence of this worm-like feature which was then in a big press conference at NASA they announced as a discovery of potential life in the solar system outside Earth. But that has not very well been confirmed subsequently. But it did raise this interesting question and so, and it is felt that water may be the key parameter and we ought to be looking for water and its uh, presence which is why the whole uh, plan to explore Mars is driven by the theme of wanting to trace water, find where water is. Now water on Earth covers a large fraction of the surface and uh, though uh, in its early phase of formation it was subject to high temperatures and a lot of these volatiles, a lot of the water would have escaped and so surface water could have evaporated and drifted back into space which then means a lot of this water that we today have on the surface of Earth could have come from other sources, comets, cometary impacts, etc. have been suggested. So it, the water we encounter today must have derived, del, must have been delivered long after the formation of the Earth. And there is a puzzle in terms of if you look at how the sun itself is not a very steady star, though in our lifetimes it is all very steady. However, if you look at it uh, as a sun, as a star, you find that the surface temperature of the sun slowly increases. And there was a time frame of nearly about a billion, 1.5 billion years ago when it was, you know, the, the surface temperature, the, it, it, the, the temperature as seen by planets would have, uh, would, have a, would, would be above the freezing point of water, which then in, men, in turn meant that's the time when it supports life on, on, on planets around the sun. So it is a short time in terms of how uh, the time frame for life to actually take root and to survive, keeping in mind, of course, the, the probability for a large amount of bombardments during the early formation of a solar system. Now, elemental ratios also uh, are important. So there is something called deuterium to hydrogen ratio. This is one of the key elements being uh, measured by one of the experiments on the Mars mission, the Indian Mars mission. And that is an indication of deuterium is an element that has formed the early universe, uh, whereas hydrogen keeps uh, evaporating, volatiles will lose. So if I understand the D by H ratio in solar system bodies, you can get an understanding of how and where water came and where it went. So that's an important ratio that people inside this study. Uh, so yeah, so it's, and it's something we are hoping to learn from the Mars Orbiter mission. So to conclude, there are many unknowns on the uh, origin of water on Earth. And not clear how planetary bodies lose water, though these ratio maps of deuterium to hydrogen might give us some indication of that. Unclear about the special role of water in sustaining life. I want to emphasize here, as you know, water has this anomalous expansion, right? You know, ice floats because ice is at that, once it forms ice, is low density. So if, uh, you know, on a, on a planet where the temperatures go up and down and there is a, there is a season where um, the water forms ice and if water didn't have this anomalous expansion, 
the ice that formed during winter would sink to the bottom and cold water and water, liquid water will be on the surface. If that planet did not, uh, the temperature of the planet is such that, that all of that ice does not melt in the next season, in the next winter more water becomes ice and very quickly all the water really turns into ice and life cannot be sustained. Because of the anomalous expansion of water, what you see is instead ice forms at the top and water is still below that at temperatures where life can exist. So this whole question of what is so special and why water as an element which has a unique uh, capacity to have this anomalous expansion has become the sus basic building material on which life forms is not very clear. And there is something also called chirality in nature about right-handed versus left-handed. There are molecules that are right-handed and left-handed and, and you find that life forms tend to have one type compared to the other which is not at all understood. So there are many unknowns. Now we continue to listen for extraterrestrial life. This is the Allen Telescope Array. Allen is the co-founder co of uh, Microsoft using all his money to do this now. They set up a large number of arrays to listen to. This is like the SETI project. And let me close with saying that space is a universal laboratory. There are many more interesting things you can do in space than what you can do on, on ground because space offers capacity that is beyond what we can build. Astronomy is an important research field that actually brings this together. And uh, so space and astronomy are very intimately related. The discovery of extraterrestrial biology will be one of the human's greatest discoveries. And with the current expansion and capacity to both discover exoplanets and to look for interesting signatures, biological signatures through astronomical techniques, you know, spectroscopy and many other things, it looks quite viable that we may be, it may be just around the corner. And I want to emphasize that this technology and science are like a two-legged creature. You take one step in technology, that leads to new steps in a new step in, in science, and science in turn pushes and demands new technology progress in order to pursue uh, some of the unresolved questions. So it's a it's a two-legged thing, and I think it's an important point for many of you, technologists, scientists, and students, and young scientists who are in the audience who want to participate in this uh, in this quest for mankind. I extend uh, heartfelt thanks to Professor P. C. Kumar for a wonderful exposition on space astronomy. Uh, so whatever progress that has been made in space astronomy over the last five decades nearly and also projecting the possible extensions to research in space astronomy for the next few decades, Professor Sri Kumar has uh, wonderfully laid down before us uh, in the form of a nice picture. So thank you very much sir for uh, wonderful talk and uh, as it so this is uh, uh, first of the uh, four lectures that we have as part of our celebration of India's march to Mars so this is first of the series so next Sunday again at 5:30 we will have an invited uh, talk uh, on a topic related to uh, space sciences so please do come back and uh, as a token of uh, appreciation uh, I request our director uh, Dr. B. S. Shailaja to hand over a memento uh, to Professor Shri Kumar.